If you are comfortable, we're going to pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for Justin. We thank you for his willingness to be courageous, face his fears, step out of his comfort zone. We thank you that he drove, I'm sure, the speed limit home from L.A. to make it here on time. We thank you for the safe travels, God, and we just pray above all else that you would speak through him. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Kid is that? <laughs> mic, mic check. Oh, yeah. In case you guys didn't know, I'm here to rap tonight. I'm just kidding. <laughs> How's everybody doing tonight? Everybody's good. Everybody's good. My name is Justin Cash. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my wife is Holly, and those, all those babies running around are mine. Um, I'm Jackie son, son-in-law and Jim son-in-law. Nice to meet, uh, meet, meet you all. <clears throat> so, this is my first time doing this, or my second time doing this. Um, I think I've been called, not I think I've been called, I know I've been called to be a youth pastor one day. So this is like a step that uh, God and Jackie are, uh, are in the same plan to get me up here tonight. But uh, everything's good. So let's just, I'm just going to pray really quickly. And uh, here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for allowing us to gather one more time. I pray that you permeate this building, open up our hearts, open up our minds, and our lives will change tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so. <clears throat> tonight we're going to be talking about Jeremiah. I'm going to start off in some history, and then we're going to go right from Jeremiah 1. And I'm going to do it really quickly, pretty much almost the whole chapter. But my first um, scripture will be coming from Jeremiah 1, verse 1, 5. Okay, so here we go. If you didn't know, I'm going to tell you right now. Jeremiah was born unto Hilkiah of Ananoth and Libna. Hilkiah's clan, which was his father, had lived in Ananoth since the days of Solomon. Um, their ancestors were high priests at that time, so that's where Jim Jeremiah kind of comes from. In case you relate to that or you want to put yourself in this story or you just want to visually picture it in your mind. So uh, Jeremiah had three siblings. He had two older brothers, Joash and Lemuel, and then he had a younger sister named Zeruah. I hope I said that right. Uh, yeah, Jeremiah was the youngest of three brothers. Uh, he actually wasn't like the rest of the family, it says in this book I read. Uh, it says that he was... The family was more like a blue collar type of family. A lot of people worked, kind of worked their land. And uh, Jeremiah liked to read and write and stuff like that. And, and in fact, as a kid, uh, he was walking his uh, goat one day and there was thunder. And his goat got knocked to the ground and it knocked himself to the ground, but his goat fell off what I would describe as like a cliff and it died. So Jeremiah got up and he was sad and he went home and they were all sitting at the dinner table and they were all talking about their night and their day. And Jeremiah was explaining his story. He was like telling his family that uh, my goat fell off and it, it got startled by the thunder and it, and it fell off and it died. And he said that it also knocked me to the ground. And his brother Lemuel said, weren't you afraid that you were gonna die too? And Jeremiah said, no, I was not afraid that I was gonna die because God has sent me here on a plan and that plan has not been fulfilled. So uh, some of you, and myself too, I've sat in your seat before, we're no different, are struggling right now or have struggled with your identity of who you are. Because maybe your family was not there like they should have been. Maybe you grew up in a one-parent household and maybe you didn't have a father and you just struggled with who you were as a kid growing up. I'm here to tell you tonight that you were loved, first of all, and that God has a, also has a plan for your life, that he has called you before you were even knitted in the room. Yes. It actually says in uh, Jeremiah 1, verse 4, verse 5, it says that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So basically, no matter what happened after you were born, 
And no matter what the world told you, you were going to be or who you were destined to be or you were going to end up like, God had already chosen your path and he had already created something that he wanted you to do. Whether it's uh, be a minister up here, play a guitar, play something, or verbally go out and speak to people. Because that is like our, our, our grand mission, if you're a believer in Christ, is to go tell your good news. And if you have good news, you need to share it. Because God has risen. Jesus has risen. He has died. He has given us a second chance of life. Um, so, understand. That's the first note. If you're taking notes. Any, any note takers out there? You're my people. <laughs> you're all my people. Um, so, first note is, understand that you have been called. So, moving a little forward. So God came to Jeremiah and he had chosen him and excuse me, he told Jeremiah that you're going to be a prophet. But I, I have things that, I need, that you need to tell to the people. And it says I'm pretty much paraphrasing in uh, verses 69 it said that Jeremiah said when God told him this but Lord I don't know how to speak. God tells him, don't say that you don't know how to speak. You must go wherever I command you to go, and I will give you my words to speak to the people. Pretty much, uh, if I was in that situation, I said it the other night, that I don't know if God came to me in, in however way, and he told me to just do whatever he wanted me to do when I was not his will, or when I was not as deep, in his will as I am now, that I would just be like, okay, God, I'm just going to shut up and do it. Because uh, I don't know about you, but I'm a little stubborn, and uh, it takes a few kicks in the butt sometimes to get me going to where I need to do. Ask my wife, she'll tell you the same thing. Um, so yeah, so the first thing Jeremiah said was, but Lord, I don't know how to speak. And God says, I'll give you the words to speak, and I will tell you where to go. So basically God said, if you just remove yourself and allow me to do everything else, I'll use you. I'll use you. So, number two, the next, the next note is accept the call. Accept that you have a plan, that God has a plan for your life, and that he's called you to do something. Now it's your choice and your decision to accept that call. You can choose not to accept it. That's your choice. I guarantee he keeps chasing you down and chasing you down until you're at your lowest point and he can finally be face to face with you and I guarantee he breaks through on you. But you can fight it, and he will keep chasing you, because that's the kind of God we serve. He never stops, he never forsakes us. Even though sometimes you might feel alone, he never leaves us. He's always right there. So number two, and that second note is accept the call. So God also gives Jeremiah two visions. Anybody know what those visions are? I'm gonna explain it to you, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so the first vision was, God said, what do you see, Jeremiah? He said, I see a branch of the almond tree. And, and what this meant was that God is always watching to see that his word is fulfilled. So like I said, no matter what you do, God is will, it will be fulfilled. No matter if you fight it, if you try to run from it, hide it, hide from it, he will find you and his will will be fulfilled. The second vision was a boiling pot was tilting towards Judah from the north. This boiling pot is described as a disaster that is coming from the north to, towards Judah. And why is this disaster coming from the north towards Judah? Because the people in Judah at that time were idolizing, worshiping, and sacrificing to man-made gods. So God called Jeremiah to go and warn the people of Judah that this is coming if you don't turn away from your sins. If you don't stop praising altars and man-made uh, sculptures, who's going to send this disaster. So I'm going to explain a little more about who the people of Judah were. See, God had given the people of Judah everything they needed to live life abundantly. He had given them land, given them food, he had given them protection. But that wasn't enough for Judah. And much like us, God, God can give us, he gives us everything we need when we're born. I, I really believe that. Whatever cards you're dealt, God has given you those cards because he knows you can handle them. But sometimes, we all know that is not enough. We go seeking and getting interested in things that we know are no good for us, and we end up in a very dark place. So, like the people of Judah, that's how we're kind of similar. 
at that time, in, in the times before that, they all they did serve. They said they did serve God. Their ancestors did serve God. They did they did have everything they needed. And somewhere down the line, they strayed from God, like many of us. I grew up in a, a PK home. Anybody know what a PK kid is? I'm a PK from the day I was born. And uh, I, even myself, strayed away from the Lord at a point in time. So, God, God through Jeremiah warns the people over and over again to turn from the wicked ways and he will not send this disaster. He warns them a numerous amount of times. If you ever read, if you ever read Jeremiah, you've read that over and over again. That's like the main focus. Like, if you just turn from your ways, I won't send this disaster. If you just turn your eyes upon me in the middle of your mess, I will come and I will save you. But that wasn't enough for Judah. Judah was, Judah was very stubborn, like myself. It even says in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, it says, If you, Israel, ret will return, then return to me, declares the Lord. If you put your detestable idols out of my sight and no longer astray, and if in a truthful, just, and righteous way you swear, as surely as the Lord lives, and the nations will evoke blessings by him, and in him they will boast. And then verse 4 says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts, you people of Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Or my wrath will flare up and burn like a fire because of the evil you have done. It will burn with no one to quench it. And still, Judah didn't listen. So God sends a disaster. I'm going to explain the disaster right now. So this disaster, uh, if you read Jeremiah, anybody heard of the king of Babylon? Anybody can say his name? Nebuchadnezzar, I hope that's right. Is that right? Okay. So Nebuchadnezzar was going to, him and his army were going to come and they were going to take uh, Judah. And Judah was going to become captive. And Judah was going to serve uh, the king of Babylon. Some of them were going to die. Some of them were going to become slaves. Some of them were going to get sick and die. So if you kind of see this, uh, what's going on right now. And... If they would have just turned from their wicked ways, it actually, their sin is what made them captive. Anybody ever been captive of their sin? Yeah. Yes. yes. Their sin is what put them in bondage. Their sin is what put generational curses over their children's children. Which is the reason why many of them died. If they just would have turned from their ways, their families would have been saved. They would have never been slaves. They would have never got sick. They would have never been hungry. They would have never had to leave their homes. But they didn't want to listen to their eyes. They didn't want to listen to God's words from Jeremiah. But even in the end, God said that he would still restore them. He said that this is going to, he told them, this, you're going to become captive and all these things are going to happen to you. But even in the end, I'm still going to restore you. I'm still going to restore you after you've turned your back on me. I'm still going to come and rescue you from your bondage and your, your chains and your captivity. And he does. And once again, it's not good enough for Judah. They don't listen. They even beg. They even beg for God's mercy, and yet they still turn from him again. Anybody ever uh, been an addict? Addicted to something? And um, you, you finally got help and you relapsed? Anybody did that? Rather it been a day or you relapse after a year or whatever it may have been, that's that's this scenario. <laughs> that's this scenario right now. That we, we we were just waiting for someone to rescue us and God came, He said, I'm taking this from you. And like the people we are, who said, Okay, thank you, God. And then as soon as things got good again, as soon as we got back on our feet, what did we do? We went right back to our old tricks. In our old ways, because that's what the devil does. He does not come with new tricks. He tempts you with the same things you struggle with your whole life. He tempts you with the things your parents struggle with, that you saw them struggle with. And he laughs at you. He goes, your parents could beat this. You can't beat this either. But that's just not how our God works. Our God says that he will still restore you. Right. He will still restore you. That's why Jesus died. He said, I'm taking this from you. And I know you're going to stumble. But every time you stumble, I'm going to be right there, Amen. reaching out my hand. Amen. So number three, oh, I'm sorry, I found number three. Oh, my main point of this was, we are like the people of Judah. 
slash Israel. When we choose to praise our own gods, idolize people or things of this world, we get lost in our own sin and we put ourselves in bondage slash chains and make ourselves captives of our own sins and decisions, just like the people of Judah when God warned them over and over again. So note three is, if we would just listen to when God speaks to us and we know he's speaking to us, anybody ever had God speak to them? Anybody ever been in their room and God came in a vision or silently was like, I need you to do this or you need to stop doing this? If we would just listen to those words, we wouldn't even become captive or even be tempted with our own sins. The things that have held us down for generations and our whole lives. So if we would just listen, and the second part of that, if we would just seek God. In that moment of temptation, in that moment of weakness, when the devil's prowling and he's coming to destroy, kill, and steal, if we would just turn our eyes and seek God in that moment, God would show up. And we would never even have to become like the people of Judah. We would never even have to walk those waters again. So, that's pretty much it. But I'm going to close this thing up really quickly for you guys. So, like I said, I was, uh, I don't know if some of you were here, but I shared over my son is a year now. I think I shared it a year and a half ago here. And uh, I told you guys I, I was addicted to pornography for 10 years, 10 years. I was 12 or 13 when it started. I didn't get broken at that chain over my life until I was 23. So I'm gonna share this story really quickly with you guys. So um, it started when I was 12 or 13. Um, I was, I tried to, I tried to be in the church and be in my addiction at the same time, but you can't serve two gods. So it wasn't saying you'll, was it, you'll hate one and despise the other. And I ran with the one that was going to take, take my life. Um, so that happened for, I did that for a while. And then I just became a church goer and I sat in the seats and I came every Sunday and never listened to, never got nothing out of it. We continued to be broken. And then one night I was up in my room, like three o'clock in the morning. I'm watching my friends. I'm looking at my friend's Instagram that I went to high school with, and I see her testimony and I click on it. I think it was like an hour long. I watched the whole thing. Um, and at that time she was going up a room. And I text my my wife now, wherever she is, uh, say, "Hey, I want to go to upper room." So me and my wife's first date, kind of, first couple of dates, we're at upper room. I went on a Mission 111 night, and I walked into that place. If you ever been there, and if you ever been there, but it's upstairs. Yeah. And as soon as you hit the top, the atmosphere changes because of the people there, and just God is just there. So it was a Mission 111 night, and everybody was sharing their stories and the miraculous things that they had seen. People getting healed, and uh, I wanted that in my life. I, I actually craved that in my life. But I told my wife that I need to be there. Like I need to be here. This is where I need to be. So we started going there. Uh, quickly, we decided to get married. We were like eight months into our dating, and we were like, let's get married. So we got married, I think nine months after that, we've been married two years, a little over two years now. Yeah. Um, but I was still in my addiction, and I took that addiction into my marriage. And uh, <clears throat> I entertained a lot, of, uh, a lot of demons and devils, and I brought that into my home. Because if you do not, serve the Lord and walk with the angels, surely if you entertain the devil and the demons, they will follow you right into your home. So I'm going to try not to cry when I tell the second part of the story. But uh, one day I was at work and my wife called me. I'm about to start crying. <laughs> um, she's like, uh, your daughter says something keeps hitting in her face when she sleeps. So I'm like, what? I don't really believe in uh, like ghosts or anything like that, that kind of like demons. And um, I said, okay. So that night I sleep in the bed with her and I tried to do the little thing where you uh, lay in the bed and then you hop out when she falls asleep. That doesn't work. As soon as I hit the ground, she screamed. So we did that all night and I, I eventually gave up. It was just like, I'm just gonna sleep in here with my daughter. So I go back to work. Next day I come home, or well, the same day I come home. And uh, I, tell, I, tell, I ask my daughter, like, what's going on with you? She's like, such and such keeps hitting my face when I'm asleep. 
I go, what? What? So what did we do? Me and the, I was kind of in crossfire at the time, not in any position. I was just lingering. And because uh, God put me there. And we called up our crossfire buddies. And they came to my house. And Dan the Man, everybody knows Dan the Man? <laughs> Dan the Man walks in and he goes, before we do this, before we bless this house and get whatever's in here out, um, God told me that you need to confess something. And in that moment, um, he told me that if you don't confess what you're dealing with, this thing's going to become harder after your kids. Yes. Or harder after whoever it's attached itself to in this house. So in that moment, I decided to give up my 10 years of addiction and confess that I was addicted to por pornography and that I had brought that into my marriage and into my home. And whatever was in my home was because of me. Uh, so we prayed that night and uh, confessed. <laughs> And we blessed my house, and, and uh, when we were done with that, like there was just a light in my house that I had never seen before. Like I can't explain it; you would have to be there. But if you've been in one of those moments where it finally the, the chains over your life have been broken, it was one of those nights. It, my my house lit up like never before. And ever since then, I've been broken from my from my my addiction to pornography. I might lie to you guys and tell you that I don't get tempted. But God tells me, like, I, I did that for you, and I gave you the strength to beat it. So you don't have to go through that anymore. So you're not Amen. weak anymore, and you don't have to fight that fight, because that fight has already been won. Amen. Amen. So in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, right. I'm going to close this up. This is it. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me, and when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. Ben, if you're coming up, you can come. Yes. So God never, God never gave us something and told us not to do any work. When he says that he has plans for your life, plans to give you hope in the future. He doesn't just mean to sit in your chair and go to church every Sunday and he's just going to do something miraculous for you and your chains are going to be broken. He also says, if you seek me, you will find me. So tonight, that is your choice. If you, if you don't know God or if you want God, if you want God to do something with your life, if you want him to take you deeper, if you want, if you want to find out your plan, you're going to have to seek him and listen to him. I promise you your lives will be changed. Because if God can take yes. a pornographer, and I'm talking about Crossfire right now, a drunk, people living on the river, people abusing drugs, if he can take all those people and make yes. them men of God yes. and women of God and yes. put them in a group like this, yes. why can't he do it for you? Amen. You don't have to be who you've always been. You don't have to do what you've always done. Thank you, guys. Uh, love you guys. We're going to do prayer after one final worship song. Yes. Thank you.